Someone once told me the grass is much greener. I still need to watch all of this show in order. There is a mixture of sadness, but at the same time, there's a mixture of a little bit of humor, which you can definitely expect in this series. Every character has multiple dimensions, really. Obviously, it's a scripted show, but they don't feel scripted. They feel real. They feel genuine. If kids find value in things, I think there is value in them, because it is art in its own way, and it is very important. Whatever it is, just own it. You know, love what you do and do what you love. If it's cool to you, then, you know, who cares about what the others say? Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of We're In Between, the podcast that discusses about an episode of As Told By Ginger once a week. I am Patricia. I'm Ashley. I'm Casey. So we actually have a bonus podcast for you guys. And this bonus podcast consists of a very special guest. He is the music composer for As Told By Ginger, as well as other various shows. We have none other than Jared Faber. Jared, welcome to We're In Between. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So, um, I guess we'll start off with a very simple question. I'm sure you get this one a lot, but who were your influences in doing music? Oh, uh, so many. You know, growing up, I listened to, you know, started out just sort of listening to, to, to radio and, you know, I always liked pop music and everything that was on the air. And then it started going into kind of, you know, hip hop and stuff was really emerging at the time that I was like, you know, in junior high and that was a thing. And um, then I started getting into blues kind of early on. And then I went to see um, this uh, this documentary about Chuck Berry when I was a freshman in high school that kind of turned me on to like kind of an, a whole bunch of stuff. And as high school went on, I kind of started getting involved in jazz. And then I wound up, you know, going to, to Berkeley College of Music and studying, uh, you know, kind of with a concentration in, in jazz. And so all of that music that I've mentioned, which is a ton of music right there, uh, it's all influential. I guess the the biggest point as as someone who mostly makes a, a living as a as a composer is that uh, film and TV scores, for the most part, were not my biggest influences. It was much more about songs and pop music and in all the various genres of pop music or subgenres of pop music. And when I say pop music, I I in, include things that are not necessarily strictly pop, like you know. Yeah, you know, sure. music that's generally played by bands or, uh, you know, <laughs> as opposed to orchestras. Yeah, sure. Any person or band in particular that you were heavily influenced by? Um, I'm a guitar player, so I definitely went through, like, periods of, of various guitar people, uh, which, you know, George Benson and Wes Montgomery would be big guitar people for me. The music of Miles Davis has always been super uh, nice. sort of present sort of realized without realizing quite how much of a fan I was that I probably had more records or CDs at the time by Miles Davis than any other individual artist. But there was also like a lot of, uh, I mean, so much music, really. It's, it's, it is kind of hard to, it depends on the day. Right now I'm wearing a, a Tribe Called Quest sweatshirt, so that, I guess, is a, an influence as well. <laughs> you know, but, you know, it, it's all over the map. Absolutely. Uh, Casey, do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, do I? Um, so this is going to be pretty stalkery, but I was I was uh, studying up on your Wikipedia page, and I saw that you uh, grew up in New York City, went to the High School of Performing Arts, the, the Fame School. I was wondering if you, I recently moved to New York City to pursue a music career uh, for a little, a little related music direction uh, for theater. And uh, I'm interested in what your experience with music in the city was like and uh, what it was like at the High School of Performing Arts. Yeah. Um, and you guys are all in New York, right? Just me. No, just him. Oh, you're the only one in New York. I'm Midwest. I used to live in New York, but now I live in Florida. So, yeah, the, the question being uh, about what it was like uh, music-wise in New York and growing up. I lived with my mom in Florida. Oh, really? In Where Florida in Florida? Until I was... Uh, Lauder Hill, oh, Fort Lauderdale area. Yeah, I, that, I'm actually not too far away from there. That's cool. Um, this, you know, from the time I was about two, three years old until I was 10 years old. And at 10 years old, I moved, uh, to New York. And, um, so there was definitely the time when I moved to New York, I would say 
I, I remember the music I was listening to in Florida, and I remember what was changing in New York at that time. So just as a point of reference to start the answer to that question, you mm-hmm. know, I remember in Florida, it was, you know, this would have been 70s, 80s, you know, and I remember like Duran Duran Rio was big, the police synchronicity, men at work. This was the music I was like really aware of when I was would have been in the, like the fifth and sixth grade mm-hmm. uh, prior to moving to New York. When I got to New York and I started going to a public high school, which was kind of like a, they call it like an alternative school. It was kind of like a, a magnet school or whatever you needed to kind of be accepted, but it was public and sort of loosely arts oriented. You know, there was a lot of like that was, you know, hip hop was happening in New York City at that time. Break dancing was happening and uh, all of the music that went along with that, you know, um, that would have been you know, Run DMC, LL Cool J, uh-huh. Fat Boys, UTFO. Like, I remember hearing that radio stations in New York that were starting to play, not necessarily hip-hop, but sort of R&B that was starting to be very hip-hop influenced, like Shaka Khan and uh, Houdini. I remember hearing that stuff. And then, so I wanted to go to high school performing arts. I wanted to, um, I was starting to get into guitar I was listening to, uh, you know, I was, I was learning Beatles songs and that sort of thing. And so I auditioned uh, to go to high school performing arts. You needed to audition for the major that you wanted to be part of. You couldn't just go there and, you know, dabble in various disciplines. Right. So I auditioned for uh, the drama department, although I didn't want to be an actor. It seemed like a good move to audition for it. I auditioned for the music department on guitar, which is what I wanted to do. You know, I wasn't classically trained. I wasn't playing jazz. I couldn't really read music. I could, and I had kind of a basic understanding of what reading music was, but I couldn't sit down and play written music, really. And my audition piece was literally me singing and playing Dust in the Wind. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Uh, Which I, at the time, I had no idea the absurdity of it. I thought that was pretty reasonable. It was kind of hard to finger pick it and sing. Right. But it worked, apparently. It did not. I did not get accepted. Oh. I got into the drama department, which... Um, Interesting. Which directly leads to um, how I met Emily Kapnick, the creator of As Told by Ginger, who was also in the drama department at High School Performing Arts at that time. And um, so throughout high school, I did go there as a drama major, and I did remain um, a musician throughout and always had my guitar and always was taking lessons outside of school and eventually... Uh, coerced some teachers in the music department to allow me to take uh, a class in that department, the jazz improv class, which really not that wasn't done. You know, you you had to do only your major. But you know, and I was friends with a lot of the kids in the music department, and you know, many of them are have gone on to be professional musicians. And I went from there to to study music in college. So anyway, I mean, and then as far as what was going on in music at that time in New York, so I graduated high school in 1990. So I guess I was in high school from 86 to 90. The music that sticks out in my mind is like, this is when I was, I was really starting to explore jazz because I mistakenly, well, I, I ultimately, that became very personal music for me. But I would say at that time, I mistakenly felt that the most important thing was to pursue more and more sophisticated music. Sure. You know, as a means to getting better, I guess. And I started realizing that a lot of the music that um, I was sort of getting turned on to at that time, at that time in the sort of jazz world, one of the things that was happening was it was sort of the middle of the sort of fusion era of jazz. I don't know that, you know, it was uh, there was a certain movement of, of music that I started to realize that the stuff that I was listening to or people were telling me to check out or that I liked was actually happening in the city on a regular basis. Sure. And um, one of the guitar players who I was really interested in those days was a, a guitar player named Hiram Bullock, who he was the, the first, uh, you know, some people might know him. He was the first guitar player in the Letterman band when, when David Letterman first went on the air. He was kind of a session player and well-known New York guitar player. But the point is, I kind of got hip to him and was listening to that music and then realized that he was playing in New York in the city, like pretty much every week, as were guitar players like John Schofield and Mike Stern and a lot of these sort of fusion jazz guitar player, uh, as well as lots of other music in the jazz world, as well as like a, a still vibrant like bebop scene. Um, there was a club called Augie's, which is now uh, Smoke on uh, 105th and Broadway. 
and the thing about it is that in those days you could kind of go out as a as a kid and get into some of these clubs you know right uh and hear the music it wasn't like oh every week i was out in some jazz club it wasn't like that but like you know my 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 dad could take me out or maybe someone i knew was playing or at some point i uh was living close to where there was a spot that people were playing and i would just sometimes take a walk and hang out outside and hear the music um so that was one of the things that was happening um totally. the other thing that was happening in music at that time i mean the beastie boys license to ill came out when i was a freshman in high school when i look back on it now i see so much that was going on in music and right in new york i was sort of aware of it but not so conscious of it but i knew that i liked the music that was specifically coming out of new york i sort of had that as a detriment in my mind of like a new york versus la thing because i live in la now and ultimately moved out here mm-hmm. um, to pursue this work and starting with as told by ginger well, that's awesome. And I definitely, you mentioned jazz fusion, and I definitely hear that influence in As Told by Ginger. Oh, no. That's not deliberate. Yeah, I mean, it's not literally jazz fusion. I, I get the scores mixed up with Hey Arnold, too, which has some of that as well. But yeah, that's that's super interesting. Um, I, I should probably pass it along to Ashley. Yeah, sure. As a composer, you also composed the theme song, and just a quick note to you that uh, me and Casey did uh, a podcast on like our top five everythings and we both agreed that yours was the top Nicktoon theme song so props to you for that. I just want to know like what your influences were like what the process was in writing that and that sort of thing. You know as I mentioned uh, you know I've been friends with Emily Kapnick for since high school and um, when that show started to go into development and we started talking about musical styles um, some of the you know, we were kind of kicking around a lot of bands that were like, uh, like the band Garbage and um, a lot of bands that sort of had a bit of an electronic sort of production-y element, but were sort of rock, you know, a little bit of like things that had a female um, point of view, if that's a, a fair way to put it. You know, uh, you know, obviously, as told by Ginger is a, you know, a show about a young girl who's going through a lot. So, you know, we, we, we wanted to have a, a musical palette that reflected that. And um, originally, the song was going to be more in that sort of style. You know, Emily and I wrote it together, as we have on many shows and many theme songs. Uh, I had done a demo, which I think we even aired. I think the first couple of episodes had the old theme song. And then I don't know how it came to be that Macy Gray wound up performing it but both emily and i loved the first macy gray record it had just come out at that time i was living in new york i think emily might even told me go buy this record by this lady macy gray and we were talking about how much we dug it but this had nothing to do with the show we were just enjoying that record and then you know we did our our song which had nothing to do with that and then one day uh you know maybe a week or so into the show airing i I don't remember exactly but i you know i I know we i got a call that you know they had gotten Macy Gray to, you know, was, was going to sing the theme song. So, you know, I recorded her and we recorded her at the uh, studios of Klasky Trupo, the production company who made As Told by Ginger. Mm-hmm. Um, I was pretty excited because, I mean, I guess I would have been about, it was 1999, so I guess I was 27. I hadn't really worked with any, you know, artists on that level or who had any kind of, you know, sort of acclaim and and macy gray had at that point just won the grammy for best new artist so it was kind of like a really big deal i was really scoring my first ever animated series and um i was going to get to you know produce this song with macy gray anyway there was you know there wasn't much time at that point to change it from when i found out she was going to be doing it so i just brought the instrumental of the track that we had already made macy sang on it i think i made i might have made a new demo slightly geared toward her but it wasn't what ultimately aired. And then after I had her voice, I kind of went and remade the track in a way that I felt was sort of close to her type of style and sound production wise, the best I could do at 27 in 1999. And that's the theme song, but it was, it was great. It was exciting for me. That's great. And then did you play guitar on the show? Yep. Pretty much everything you hear on the show is me. Oh, cool. I assumed. 
That's awesome. I have to say that not only is the theme song really memorable, but a lot of the songs are too. Like when in the episode "Come Back, Little Seal Girl," you have the Little Seal Girl song. You have "It's Courtney," and you know also various episodes like "Splinter in My Heart" and um, you know a lot of the other songs. So, what was the process and influences of writing those songs? Um, usually, what happens, uh, and this is not just unique to "As Told by Ginger," but in the case of As Told by Ginger, certainly. Um, it, usually the, the scripts were written and those songs were written into the script by the writer. So in many of the cases, that would have been uh, Emily, who you know decided that she wanted a song here or she would write, hey, you know, at this point, Ginger picks up her guitar and sings. And then she would write out in the script the lyrics. A lot of the times when it was Emily... I mean, and again, I've been working with her for so many years and, you know, we kind of have our way that we do things. A lot of times I've, I've, it's just been best that she'll sing it to me what she has in mind. You know, she'll sing uh, some sketch that she has in mind. She usually has an idea for a melody. Sometimes she, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes I get the script and I just look at the um, lyrics and I put a song to it. But most of the time it works out sometimes i do that and she goes can i after i've written the song she'll be like yeah it's good can i can i sing you how i imagined it and i'll say sure and i'll be like oh yeah let's do that you know and then i'll kind of rework her idea into um more of a song uh in the case of little seal girl that one was written by eric casimiro who was a producer on the show and again someone who i've gone on to work with for years and he 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 usually has it written into the script and it, it it flows in a way that fits nicely to music but he doesn't generally give me any musical direction other than like maybe style he might say this is a you know a pop tune type number or whatever you know anyway i do it and the actors record it and then you know that happens ahead of animation and you know does that answer the question that's basically it yeah that answers the question just fine yeah so uh in terms of the production of the instrumental tracks um would you have session musicians or would you use like loops and samples exclusively on as told by ginger on the theme song uh it was myself and there were two session musicians a drummer i assume right there was a drummer and actually i had a bass player on that both great great guys um who play on all kinds of stuff but um Aside from that, like I said, pretty much everything you hear is me. I mean, unless wow. unless there was a situation where like I needed a saxophone or a clarinet, which I don't recall if that came up. It must have at some point. Probably but in the episode like, like Ginger Solo in which when Miranda was playing the guitar, uh, the, the clarinet, or maybe that really bad clarinet in uh, the episode... Uh, of the first episode of season two where it focuses on Darren. So yeah, I, I, there was a little bit of clarinet. I don't know um, if it was. Yeah. 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 yeah that, I might've brought someone in. I don't, again, I really, I mean, it was, it was 1999, 2000. I don't, I don't recall <laughs> exactly, but yes, those, those would have been the only instances where I would um, do that. I mean, anything that had to get played on guitar, bass, anything I could do with keyboards and samples, I, I did. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, as told by Ginger, had a lot of acoustic guitar, and it had like those little rock kind of stings and stuff. You know, it had the little themes for Blake and those kids, and uh, you know, all of that was just done. You know, I either played it or we did it with with samples. Nice, and I I don't know if it was an intentional or not, but I feel like the show captures that early two thousands pop sound pretty well. Like you listen to it, and it evokes an era that's what i meant about like what we were talking about initially before you know before the macy gray thing before you know when we were just kind of kicking around with like what the sound of the show could be i mean another artist that we probably would have referenced would have been like alanis morissette and i don't yeah, you know yeah. not that the show goes all the way there as far as a band like garbage or alanis morissette it's, and it was you know the production wasn't as sophisticated and honestly i listen to it now and i find things about it to be charming and other things I'm like, wow, I had no idea what I was doing, you know. <laughs> you know, I, I think it had a sound and, you know, this, yes, definitely we, that was that was the influence. We were trying for it to sound contemporary at that time and to reference that kind of female rock, I guess. What's your, or what has been your favorite show or film to work on and why? Suburgatory was pretty great. 
Uh, and I guess the reason is, I mean, again, another um, Emily Kapnick project. And it's always great working with Emily because she's brilliant and funny. And that show had a bunch of uh, cast members from Saturday Night Live. And it had some musical numbers. And, uh, you know, it, it felt in a way there was uh, there were sort of some clear similarities to As Told by Ginger. But it was sort of all grown up. And I mean that from like the production of the show and like just our ability to make it. That was definitely a favorite of mine. I've enjoyed a lot of them. My question to you, what have been your favorite episodes of As Told by Ginger looking back on it? Hello, Stranger. I would say when we made Hello, Stranger, that was the best episode ever made. I think it's the final ever episode of As Told by Ginger. And I don't know. See, I feel like maybe the last season of As Told by Ginger never aired or something like that. Is that true? Yeah. What it was is that, yeah, the the final... (laughs) Six to eight episodes of As Told by Ginger never aired in the U.S. They did air in other locations like Canada and the United Kingdom, but for some reason, the last episodes of season three never aired. It wasn't until, believe it or not, just a few months ago in which they actually aired four out of the unaired episodes. So, a lesson so time- crazy. Yeah, I know. That is oh, so- I didn't know that. Yeah, it's true. The, well, the final, I think it's the final episode of As Told by Ginger ever, I think is the best. Oh, um, the wedding frame. Hmm. Is that it? Is it the one? Basically, it's the one where Ginger almost dies. Oh no, that's a, no, it, that's a lesson in tight ropes. Okay. Yeah the the episode the the wedding frame is the series finale, and that was with um, the wedding. You know, with right. Dr. No, the, the one where the one where where Ginger almost dies, and it flashes forward to seeing Ginger grown up. Um, yeah, that's that's a, a lesson in tight ropes. That's when Ginger. That's, I think that's gets the best sick. episode ever. Oh, really? A lesson in tight ropes, huh? I think so. I mean, again, I haven't watched any of these in a long time, but that's what I recall as being one of the best episodes. I mean, because I, I just like, to me, it was like the most genuine, like it was like, if I recall correctly, it felt very heartfelt. And there, were, I mean, there was a few. That one, uh, like I said, Hello, Stranger. Yeah, I mean, I do think that probably The Wedding Frame was was great. I don't remember that well. The one where, oh my God, I mean, all the, the ones with... Uh, Noelle Sussman. Oh my God. <laughs> like, um, you know, and she that, was that, gone and, and she was gone yeah. and she was gone. That's what I'm talking about. And she was gone is probably another great one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one, I would say <laughs> in a different way, I think it's the one with, uh, with, uh, Oh God, where Carl sings that song and the, the, the teacher. Dies. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember that's, um, no hope for Courtney. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what it's called, where, yeah. you know, Mrs. Gordon is fed up with Carl, and, you know, she decides to plan on her retirement, and Carl sings that song of wanting to get her back. And she dies. Yeah. I don't know if she dies in the show. In real life, the actress passed away, and the episode oh, was really? dedicated to her. If I, if, again, if I remember correctly, I could be saying something that's totally not true, but I think that's what happened. <laughs> so, I don't know. Those are some of my favorite, as told by Ginger. Those are the ones that stick with me anyway, the ones I remember. Wow, so those are those are really good choices, Jared. Uh, Casey, uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I, I could do one more. I was wondering if you were familiar with slash in touch with any of the other sort of Nicktoon composers of that time. So, like specifically, I'm thinking of Jim Lang and Guy Moon, who are uh, two of my other favorites. Composers, not necessarily from cartoon world, but in those days it was funny. Like I would, I would, I'd meet someone, and someone would say, "Oh, what do you do? I write music for this cartoon." And they'd say, "Oh, do you know this guy?" And I'm like, "I, I don't meet these people because um, I don't know." At the time, I didn't, I wouldn't have known where to meet them. I mean, I was working in right. my house; they were working in their house, uh, huh. or their studios, and uh, you know, we didn't. There wasn't like a social network of. Uh, people who wrote music for cartoons. Um, and I, and I gotta be honest, I didn't really follow along with who anybody was. Um, I certainly knew who Mark Mothersbaugh was, um, because he was very involved with Klasky Chupo and, and it was, a, and is a very well-known, you know, musician. Um, and I've met him once or twice. I knew who Drew Newman was cause he did the other Klasky Chupo show. I I'd met him once. Uh, and that's it. I really didn't know any of those guys. Okay, interesting. Honestly, I didn't watch those shows because I was 30 years old. 
I'll go with my last one as well here, uh, more directly show related. Uh, just who's your favorite as told by Ginger character of what you've seen, of what you remember? You know, I think the thing that was so great, are we talking about which was my favorite character or who was my favorite actor, I guess? But both. Slightly, both, yeah. Slightly I mean, the thing that was so great really was that everybody was so good. A favorite? I mean, Mrs. Gordon was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can think I can remember her voice. But I mean, you know, Melissa Disney played Ginger. I just she did a great job. And Kenny Blank, who, you know, was Darren, uh, is awesome and is uh, also a friend via As Told by Ginger. Everybody was great. Elaine Newman. I mean, God, I mean, she's, you know, classic. And I, I don't know. I don't know who my favorite was. I mean, as far as characters go, you know, Carl and Hoodsy probably yeah you know they were that was the that was you know the most fun yeah i don't know that i have a great answer for that one I, you know i liked it all totally valid thanks <laughs> okay i think that's pretty much it with our questions now we have a lot of questions from the we're in between forums so if you don't get your uh, question read, then we completely apologize. But yeah, thank you so much for all of the questions from the forums. We really do appreciate it. We actually received a few of them, so we're going to read them right now. So our first question comes from Simeon, and he asks, what is the best part about being a music composer? The actual composing part or having others listen and give feedback on your music? <laughs> uh it's definitely not the having other people give feedback on the music. <laughs> but I, um, I, no, I don't know. The best part for me is realize that I've, uh, in, until recently, had had rarely uh, ever had to see ten o'clock in the morning or earlier. I, I, it's what I love to do. I, you know, I'm, I've, I feel very fortunate to have been able to make a living making music and um, that's really the best part and uh you know yeah i do i do have a good time when i'm working on the music and i do have a good time i do enjoy uh if people enjoy the music specifically which which is it's, it's not it doesn't feel that common to me because it you know music is just a, a small piece of when you're writing for a tv show you know it's just one building block in the in the project you know it's not about the music so it's certainly nice when you know occasionally it's noticed Oh, I'm on the page right now. Do you mind if I read one of these, Patricia? Because there's one that I think is really interesting. Go for it. We have, uh, there, there are multiple questions in this comment, but I like the one, do you think the music from As Told by Ginger is timeless or more of a product of its time? And that was from Lexi uh, from mm -hmm. the forums. Well, Lexi, I think it's kind of, I, I think it's a little bit of a, pro a product of its time, but I feel like to me, when I hear it now, it's it's impossible to be objective about this, but like I said before, I feel like the show has a sound, and that's really all you in TV. I feel like that's you know it's kind of what you go for. Like it's identified with the show, whether it is or isn't of the time. I certainly don't you know wouldn't I think it would be pretentious to claim it timeless in any way. And there's so many things about it that are clearly not timeless. It is definitely stamped with that era, but I think more importantly, it just it doesn't sound like any of the other shows. It sounds like, you know, you can hear a little bit and it sounds like As Told by Ginger, I hope. And that, that's what I think it does. Okay. Um, Ashley, would you like to read a question from the forums? Uh, sure. I'm scrolling through them. I've kind of touched on some of the things from here, so I want to try to get ones that are a bit more distinct. Or if you have one up, you can ask it. All right. Well, I have one from HeartLover1717. And this is a really oh, good question, by out. the way. I love how the music introducing an episode of an, an As Told by Ginger is sometimes a shout out to another artist. For example, mm -hmm. season two, episode 32, Love with a Transfer Student. The intro sounds a little bit like Santana Smooth. Season three, episode mm -hmm. 53, Kiss Today Goodbye, sounds a little bit of What's Love Got to Do With It before adding Splinter in My Heart. There is one <laughs> tune I seem to recognize, but I cannot place. From season one, episode 11, The A Ticket, when Carl Hoodsey and Brandon are playing glockenspiels in the elementary school band, it sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon bumper, or is it just my imagination? Do you recall? <laughs> I don't. So specific. I don't, <laughs> I don't recall at all. I will say that um, I hope without ever plagiarizing, I'm sure there are times when we're sometimes trying to make a nod to a genre or an artist. Um, Oh, right. Love with, with a, the, a proper transfer student or whatever that was exactly called. 
I think that we there there might have always like we might have tried to throw in some kind of Latin influence here and there. I don't remember. Um, I don't. Yeah, maybe there was a Santana ish type of thing. I don't. I, I really don't remember that. Yeah, but I, I do. I, think that, I do that, that know that we did episode, that kind of thing. Yeah, that particular episode, it was with Ginger starting to fall in love with the transfer student named Joaquin. Right. And he was Hispanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe that was where. We the, did, yeah, I think song. we did. You know, we would have done that. Uh, yeah, I don't know what they played on the Glockenspiel on that. I, I think that, that, yeah, but, the song was basically, from what I recall, it's like do 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 or something like oh, that. You no, know, I feel like it might have been more of like an attempt to do something like really avant garde, but I don't, I really don't remember at all. Okay, well, thank you, Heart Lover. Well, Ashley finds her comment that. Uh, when you were saying you hope you didn't plagiarize or anything, but in the orchestration world, there's this great quote, um, good artists borrow and great artists steal. <laughs> so I think that can be really relevant sometimes that when you want to, we want to be clear. Sometimes you just, you know, more or less borrow something. So can I ask a question? Sure. Go for Does it. Does that happen? Yeah. Um, why not? So how long have you guys been doing this podcast? Um, we started doing this podcast um, um, almost close to like a few, about, about about a month or two, actually. Okay. And so it's just about as told by Ginger? Yeah, but we do other yeah. podcasts on the side. Like, I do a podcast called Casual Chats in which I talk about various topics, and I've been doing that for almost five years. Yeah, and me and Casey do a show called the Friday Night Nicktoons Podcast, where we talk about various Nicktoon episodes. And we, like, watched a few As Told by Ginger episodes in that, realized we really didn't know a lot about the show, had been missing out on it, and felt like because it has such a through storyline, we wanted to yeah. watch it in its entirety in order. Yeah, and yeah, that's I a hear... unique thing about As Told by Ginger, right? It's not usually done on those shows, which is, I think is part of why we didn't last all that long, you know? Yeah, it only lasted for, like, three seasons. Well, yeah, because cause it was written, like, almost real time. Like, you know, she starts high school and she kind of gets to the end of high school. This one, it's another one from Lexi, but how did working on As Told by Ginger differ from the other projects that you've worked on? And, I mean, there's been so many different kinds of projects. Things that are different was that As Told by Ginger, although it wasn't the first thing I'd ever done, uh, literally, it was the first show that was entirely mine. 100% my responsibility to get done from beginning to end. So I definitely learned a lot during that process. I got faster, you know, as, you know, for example, as told by Ginger has relative to some other animated series, it has much less music than a lot of animated series that have like sort of wall to wall music. Yet as told by Ginger took me pretty much every bit of the amount of time that I had uh, allocated, you know, to, to do each episode. I, I got faster as I went. Um, another thing that's changed a lot is that technology has changed a lot in just the few years following uh, working on As Told by Ginger. So, I, you know, I don't know if anyone would be, you know, I don't know how of interest this is to listeners and fans of As Told by Ginger, but just in terms of making music, you know, I could have done As Told by Ginger the way I did it the way it sounds, I could do that today basically with a laptop. You know, a laptop, a little interface, and a couple of guitars, and I could get it done exactly the same. You know, back then I had, you know, sort of racks full of synthesizers and samplers, and it was much more arduous and, and sort of limited. You know, now now that your palette is, is so much more wide open. And in a way, that maybe that was what was cool and why the sound was the sound, because... Once I found some things that worked, those things kind of worked, and those didn't get changed too much. So that's that's some of how things have changed since you know on other projects. But I was thinking that I was thinking I'll bet you would kill to be able to go back and do the production in like half the time that it would have taken with all that equipment. Then, yeah, I could have made it sound so much better, or I would have made so much better choices. But I also hear certain things that I think, oh wow, I was you know, kind of being in, a, in a, a different kind of creative than I am now because I was actually trying to figure out how to do it. And now I look at, if I were to look at a show like that, I would sort of assume that I knew the answer. You know what I mean? Like I could look at a scene and be like, oh, I know what this needs. This just needs to be that acoustic totally. guitar thing or whatever. Back then I was like, I don't know, is this going to work? Let me try this. Is this enough? You know, does this fly? Are they going to think yeah. it sounds like a real show? 
Or are they going to find me out that I'm just a kid? <laughs> you know, with like, right. some limited guitar. That imposter skill. syndrome you know, is so you know, real, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it definitely... Um, I think that there's some creativity that, that you know... It, you know, I, I, I like to think I'm, I'm finding ways to be creative now, but, you know, it was like I was really learning how to do that. Like, everything I did, I was trying to figure out, oh, I think this is how you do it. You know, it's never too late, totally. too, because Jim Lang has posted updated versions of his of the Hey Arnold soundtrack on his YouTube channel. So I think it'll be really Oh, those cool. are updated. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know yeah that. exactly. And um, I think it will be really cool, Jared, if, you know, whether you want to post it online on your website or if you have your own YouTube channel to post like updated versions of the As Told by Ginger theme song and some of the songs from the, the from the show. I think a lot of people would really like that i maybe i mean i feel like you know in a way everything i do is the updated version of that uh you know check out suburgatory it's kind of the updated version of as told by ginger <laughs> uh, interesting yeah. crazy collectibles asked uh were you surprised when you got macy gray to sing the theme song i guess we've sort of touched on that but not in that exact light no i was i was i was shocked yeah, and, and, he also, and he also asked, which version of the theme song do you like better? Because there's three. Ooh. Well, the, the other, I think the the um, the enduring one is 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 the one for me. Yeah, the Macy Gray one is is great. You know, we had done a version where uh, uh, Cree Summer sang one, uh -huh. and uh, Melissa Disney sang one, and you know they they sounded great too. Um, but I think the, the Macy Gray one is the one. And then in, in, in a strange, random, and somehow unrelated turn of events, Emily and I did another theme song with with Macy Gray years later for a show that Emily created called Emily's Reasons Why Not, which was you know a short-lived ABC sitcom. And I don't know why. I don't know how it came to pass. It was, you know, as I said, it's seemingly unrelated they're like, hey, Macy Gray's going to sing, sing the theme song. And we were like, oh, okay, I guess this is just what we do now. <laughs> we do theme songs. With That's songs. awesome. You know? <laughs> All right. Oh, well, I think, that for, I think for the most part, we've all, the questions have already been answered by our discussion. So, yeah, that's pretty much it for, um, you know, the questions. So, again, for all the people in the forums, thank you so much for your questions. We really do appreciate it. And I hope that you guys, um, you know, tune in for whenever we have another one. So, um, yeah, I think we can wrap things up. So, Jared, do you have any final words to say looking back on us told by Ginger? No, I don't. I, I, th I thank you guys. It's, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, that people still uh, have some interest in that show, just a, a show that basically ran for two seasons and uh between 99 and 2001 it's <laughs> it's cool that you know that it, it, uh, it resonates with some people yeah definitely all right so um i think that we can conclude this episode of we're in between so jared uh, why don't you you know plug your stuff and uh let us know if any upcoming projects that you're having Oh, okay. I'll plug my stuff. Sure. I have a project called Warren Pierce, which I would love for anybody to check out, which is a great couple of singer songwriters who I, I kind of, uh, you know, produce and write with. And, um, you know, it's, uh, war and Pierce, uh, Warren Pierce.com, uh, Facebook, all of that. And, um, yeah, you can, you know, you can check out my website for all the things I, I work on there com. Awesome. I'm well, there. I'm, I'm on, I'm on the Facebook. I'm on the Twitter. Instagram. <laughs> well, thank you so much for appearing as a guest, Jared. We really do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it too. It's fun. Yeah, thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Let let us know in the comments below on um, your thoughts on the soundtrack of "As Told by Ginger." And um, who knows? Maybe sometime um, down the line, we'll be able to have other guests for "We're in Between." If that is the case, then we'll, you guys will be the first to know. So hope to see you guys around soon, and thank you for listening. Hey.